Hello everyone. Welcome back to another Live at Five. On Tuesday, our tour took us to see the Porpoise uh, play sculpture at the Middle School for Boys by Jim Miller Melberg. And keeping uh, in line with that aquatic sensibility, uh, today I want to talk a little bit about the materials used to construct Cranbrook's favorite swimming pool, the Williams Natatorium. And the Williams Natatorium uh, was opened in 1999, uh, and it's by the architects Todd Williams and Billy Chin. Uh, and Todd and Billy are a husband and wife team, uh, and the Williams Natatorium was a gift from Todd Williams' parents, uh, who were longtime Cranbrook supporters. Um, uh, Mrs. Williams uh, actually was intimately involved. She was the chairwoman of the DeSalle Auditorium Construction Committee. And then in 1999, the Williams Natatorium, designed by their son, uh, opened here on campus. And just to place you where we are today, uh, we are at the end of this very long um, grassy lawn, which is a axis, an axial relationship, an axis uh, that leads all the way to the Booth Manor home. So if we were to walk across the grass, uh, you can just see the art museum there. That's the ramp of the Chinese dog. You go through the art museum, down the hill, and back up the hill, and you would be in George Booth's office. Uh, to the right, you see the art painting studios, then the art dormitories. These are the boys' dormitories for the high school and then the high school science center. And previous to the natatorium being constructed, uh, the axis just sort of uh, axis just ran out of steam. It just sort of ended in a clump of, of rather uninspired buildings. There you see the tower of Aliel Saarinen's design for the school for boys. And so part of redesigning Cranbrook's athletic complex was to put a building that would terminate uh, this sort of campus-wide, uh, slightly off of due north-south pathway. And so the natatorium, which is a very fancy uh, name for swimming pool, uh, opened here in 1999 as part of a whole expansion project of Cranbrook uh, buildings. And that's a longer story for a longer tour, uh, but starting in the late 1980s and moving right on through until 2002, Cranbrook constructed additions throughout the campus to each of the program areas. And instead of turning towards an architect who might have given us a revival style building, uh, uh, you have to think this is the late 1980s, postmodernism is still big, uh, a rebirth of American classicism is happening. And Cranbrook, I think under different set of leadership, uh, could have easily done Aliel Sarnin revival throughout the campus or, uh, you know, Nordic neoclassicism revival. But instead, Dr. Lillian Bowder, who was the head of Cranbrook Educational Community, uh, set up an architectural advisory committee that was made up of Cranbrook's architecture uh, faculty at the Art Academy, a practicing architect, board members, uh, herself as president, and they went out and they wanted to find young architects at the beginning of their career to help build new buildings. And so that's how we ended up with Stephen Hull's first public institution, uh, buildings by Raphael Mineo, Todd Williams and Billy Chinson here at the Natatorium, uh, and Peter Rose over at Brookside. This was the most budget unconscious. Um, it's a, about a 27,000 square foot building and it had some 500 um, submittal change requests in the construction of the building. Uh, it's a fa fairly small building for an aquatic center uh, with very little sort of any type of support facility. Uh, but my goodness, what the budget bought for this uh, 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 swimming pool. So I want to talk on today's tour. We're not going to tour sort of the whole building through and through. It's actually having a major um, uh, renovation happening on the inside. I want to talk about the materials that Todd Williams and Billy Chin used. And we'll start with these posts. Uh, this, this ceiling is made out of uh, lead-coated 
copper, uh, which is the same material that Raphael Mineo used at the new studio's building uh, uh, three years after this. And then there are these stainless steel sandblasted columns here. And I see that I have some architects and architecture historians watching today. Uh, I would like you to identify where these columns are from. Perhaps seeing the alignment of the two columns will help you. Uh, so the columns are shooting out with this sort of asymmetrical overhang bundled in these groups of threes within Honduran mahogany uh, at the center, which softens the columns and sort of links them together. Since no one guessed what architectural precedent we're looking at here, uh, Alvar Alto's Villa Morena from 1939. This is an exact one-to-one -one of Alto's entrance. So another great Finnish building that's being referenced here by this American team of architects. And whenever you look at this building and you think, oh, it's, it's pure neo-modernism, or if you don't like neo, it's pure modernism, you have to remember that you're in the sort of hangover period of post-modernism where buildings are meant to be communicative beyond just material, beyond just shape. And so I think it's very telling that uh, uh, that Todd and Billy would tie this building not only into Cranbrook's history, but into architectural history that they felt was relevant. So the building is in this um, interesting way, instead of sort of riffing on an ionic column, they're ripping on this very specific Finnish column. The next material that I want to talk about is the sort of icon of the building and what beautiful light we have to study these bricks. And of course, Cranbrook is a campus of brick architecture. Uh, Eliel Saarinen used hundreds of different types, shapes, sizes, and colors of bricks. Here at the Natatorium, there are three different types of brick. Uh, there's this large Norman brick. A Norman brick is just a, a longer brick than usual, uh, which has uh, uh, this really lovely iron spot purplish color. You'll notice this is now the, I don't know, third or fourth building that we've seen uh, where the horizontal mortar lines are raked inset and then the vertical mortar lines are flush with the brick. We saw it in the Frank Lloyd Wright Smith House. We saw it at Aelio Saarinen's Kingswood School and at his dormitory number two at the Academy. And now we see it here again, achieving again that purpose of extending the horizontality of the building and really making it sort of one uh, with the earth. Now the more distinct brick are these glazed bricks. Uh, these come from Endicott clay in Nebraska and they are actually manganese spotted bricks. So if I get close and the camera focuses, you can see how you actually see the iron spots coming through the brick. And Billy worked quite closely with Endicott to achieve a glaze that was transparent enough that you could actually see the brick body coming through. So it's a clay with manganese deposits in it. And then when it's glazed, the glaze is such a thin wash, you can see the brick through. And that was very important to her uh, in the composition. Now, when they were working with Endicott, they kept sending samples to New York and Billy kept rejecting them. She's, you know, they always looked plastic or they always looked ceramic. And she was like, I don't want a tile building. I want a glazed brick building. And so she flew out to Nebraska. And when she got there, she saw a huge stack of trash and she said, that's the brick I want. And they said, oh, we, we thought you were going for something totally uh, different. So they went with the rejected brick, repeated it and achieved this ability where the sun is actually catching the brick through the glaze. And it has this um, really gorgeous teal color. There are two different colors of brick. So that's the teal. And over here we have the blue. The teal references Kingswood School for Girls with its copper roof and its green glazed bricks. And then this blue glaze, glaze this is from the glaze recipe of Maya Grotel, who was Cranbrook's Finnish American ceramicist. She was instructor in ceramics at Cranbrook from 1938 until the uh, late 1960s. And this was her signature cobalt blue that was her sort of prized recipe. Uh, and so 
you have these references to Maya Grotel, and then you also have the reference to Aero Saarinen's General Motors Technical Center, which was completed in the 1950s. And the Tech Center was one of the first modern buildings to revive glazed brick. Uh, they had been used in Roman times, the Victorians used them, but by 1950, when Aero Saarinen specified glazed bricks, there was no one using glazed brick in an architectural manner, and there was no one who could produce a glazed brick. And so uh, here at the Natatorium, we have these references to our own history of ceramics, a reference to our most famous son uh, and his use of glazed ceramics. Aero's uh, glazed ceramics at the GM Tech Center were, of course, the colors were done by Alexander Girard, the great interior decorator uh, and all-around uh, collector of beautiful things. Now, the next material that we see is plenty of concrete, and uh, Todd and Billy were insistent that you could see none of the formwork um, tiebacks, and so they used uh, a system of plastic tiebacks that were then whittled at the end, and so you can't figure out how the formwork was held in place. There's no big uh, knobs where you see how the wooden formwork or the metal formwork was put in place. After they got this formwork list concrete, uh, they then sandblasted it or acid washed it. So it's a combination of both. And I'm not sure. On the back of the building, you can really see the difference between the sandblasting and the acid etching. Um, but it gives it that really smooth texture. On the ground, we have cast concrete block. But I want to walk over... Uh, and see the next material on the outside of the building. Through this little forest glen, we will come to the Honduran mahogany doors. So these are 20-foot doors, our louvers. Uh, Todd and Billy wanted them to be made out of um, uh, juba trees from Africa. However, those are incredibly endangered and a really uh, rare tropical hardwood. So they went with a less endangered tropical hardwood and went with Honduran mahogany. Um, it is holding up pretty well for uh, 21 year winters here in Michigan. And we'll see on the inside where those louvers lead. Now, a little bit about the form of this building. Um, what you see is just this wall, and it has this great kink in it uh, where the sort of metaphysical force of the uh, axis cruising from George Booth's office all the way through the art museum past the Orpheus Fountain comes and it just bends the building. And so this is the dead center of the entire north-south axis and you have the bricks joined together in this quite lovely zipper uh, going all the way up and then transitioning to the Roman bricks and then transitioning to the lead-coated copper uh, little cornice, which of course Aelil Saarinen uses a similar cornice on the top of the art museum. So everything's referencing everything else. And then if you're just joining me, we're looking down towards the art museum. Uh, I'm your host, Kevin Adkisson, curator, uh, and we're doing a tour of Todd Williams and Billy Chin's natatorium. So we'll step inside for just a moment. We, as I mentioned, are doing construction work. And so uh, it it is a construction site, um, but I have generously been allowed in. And so everything on this building is custom. That's part of why the, the um, price of it just goes so astronomically uh, beyond what was intended. Um, so you have custom door handles, you even have the custom little window here, you even have the custom swipe pad there where the concrete is formed and then the swipe pad lets you in. And when you step into the building, you come face to face with this glass wall. And so it's this frosted glass panel that's simply in front of the window behind it. And so it gives us that sort of underwater aquatic feeling right when you step into the door. And then when we look to our left, you realize that this wall is just a facade. Uh, there, there really is nothing to this entire wing of the building. It's all circulation, so it's just the ramp. Uh, what's interesting, if you look at 
Uh, this is a 1996 design, opened in 1999. If you go back to the 1994 and 1995 plans, this ramp is actually just a facade wall with arched openings in the manner of Charles Moore, uh, the sort of screen wall. And of course, uh, Billy, Billy had studied at Yale uh, as an undergraduate with Charles Moore, and then she went to UCLA when Moore left and went to California. And so uh, uh, Todd Williams, who went to Cranbrook School for Boys and then Princeton, Princeton, Princeton for his uh, BA, MRC, and I think he has three Princeton degrees. Um, he has a very different attitude to the sort of uh, attitude that, that Billy brings to the projects. And so this screen wall device, um, which is just circulation, remember the other side of this wall is blue glazed brick, but remember where it changed color? So the ceiling height is reflecting where the Norman brick is on the other side. Uh, however, on the inside, it's the teal brick, and then I love this detail. This is the kind of detail that you get when you have uh, an, in, an in-house architect who is approving all schematic drawings. The donor wall becomes this sort of integral piece of the uh, bricks. And like any good development officer, you know, m ambitious amount of panels waiting for donors to come and support the project. We have more uh, mahogany, Honduran mahogany here. And at the end of the... Uh, uh, ramp, you see a custom concrete wall, and these custom concrete blocks were made in Grand Block, Michigan, uh, south of Flint. And then there is this uh, bridge that connects to the Aliel Saarinen Design Gymnasium. Uh, I'm worried about walking all the way to the end of the ramp. I don't want to lose our Wi-Fi connection. So if anyone has any questions while we're looking. I'm happy to answer them. Uh, as we look up at the ceiling, we see more um, bead blasted metal pieces. Uh, and the interesting thing about these uh, bead blast pieces is that once you bead blast stainless steel, you can't touch it. The oils in your hand will simply take the finish off. Uh, and so just the, the, the sequencing of events and the labor that went into the construction and the amount of pieces that they had to remove, re-bead blast them, uh, eventually they decided to lacquer these pieces before putting them onto the ceiling, though that did change the ultimate uh, look of the pieces. So we get to our sort of uh, lower end of the ramp, connecting us to Aliel Sarnan's gymnasium, which we see on the opposite side. Uh, the Keppel Gym of 1931, which has this great copper roof and then these very thick masonry walls. And remember what you've uh, hopefully learned on other tours, every wall that Aliel Sarnan builds is a load-bearing wall. And so those brick walls are actually supporting the steel frame of the roof above. And so that thickness, that poche of the building is actually supporting the weight of this enormous volume of space. And it's also holding a suspended track versus the brick walls of the natatorium are doing something very, very different, and we'll see that here in a moment. Uh, they did keep this nature trail that runs through, and so you uh, can actually walk underneath this pathway. We are going to uh, take in the view towards the pool deck, which we will not be going into. Uh, I'm holding on to a custom handrail here. Uh, Todd and Billy talk about really starting their design methodology from the inside and working their way out. So the exteriors of their buildings are simply expressions of what's happening on the inside. And then the details come from how your body interacts with them. And so you go and you go past a custom door pull, you sit on a custom bench. Uh, this bench is made out of Pietra Cardona, Italian slate. And it's a very cool slate. So you, you have these different sort of temperatures that your body is interacting with. I almost ripped that down before this tour, uh, but you pass this sort of glass light well uh, that is a skylight up above and then the boys' locker room down below. Uh, and so you have this, uh, it's almost like you, you're in a pond when you're in the actual locker room because the light is coming all the way through and you can sort of see these fish moving along to the side uh, up above you. And then we pass by 
these custom tiled uh, walls, which are made in Philadelphia, uh, handmade and hand selected. And they're used in ways that are almost uh, like Loya Saarinen's tapestries. And so joining in this tapestry tradition of Cranbrook, you get the linearity, the grid of the tapestry, and you get the surface flatness of tapestry as well. And so once we move past the tapestry, we get to the main event which is the actual pool space. So we are replacing the um, slate pool deck with a Canadian granite pool deck. And Todd and Billy are the architects of the new uh, pool deck project. So it is uh, the original designers. The slate that was there was quite slippery. And so uh, we'll have a, a new, uh, hopefully safer pool deck but what a room this is. Um, we are looking at the pool itself, covered in a tarp, but it's made out of little ceramic teal tiles. Uh, and notice that it's not a ramp down uh, to the deep end, but it's a sima recta, a curve of beauty, um, something that has been used since ancient times. Harry Weiss uses it when he designs the Washington Metro. Um, so it's all these sort of wonderful connections to architecture history, to Cranbrook, uh, and it's a much more elegant way of getting to the deep end with this, the curve of beauty. But the main of it is the ceiling, uh, which is a suspended ceiling uh, made out of a, a sort of synthetic uh, woven fiberglass material in this very deep shade of blue. And it's suspended from a steel frame that's um, a, a kind of a modified Virendel truss. So if you took these blue panels off, it would look sort of like a waffle iron. Um, and the steel then runs through steel panels in the wall. The masonry is no longer load-bearing, and part of the reason is that the roof and the walls are not attached. Um, they're two separate structural systems because of what is happening in these holes. Uh, these giant dark circles, or oculi, are actually open air, and they're covered by um, plastic domes that are on rails that run on steel beams across the roof. And so you can vent the entire pool by rolling the dome onto this side of the roof. Now the weight of this action is actually so severe that it causes the entire pool roof structure to torque. And that is intentional. That's how the engineer designed it. But because the roof torques as these two um, uh, skylights open, the roof and the wall system have to be separate or else you would end up crushing the walls as the roof moved. Kind of amazing. We also see the mahogany um, louvers, three on this wall, five on this wall, five on this wall, three on the wall behind me. And then there are the windows that are down by the pool deck. So that as you're swimming back and forth, you can look out left and right into the pinetum. This is one uh, area to watch the swimmers. You can also have this sort of sun deck off the back. Uh, and then there is the area where you can watch the swim meets from the other side as well. Of course, custom cases, custom lighting in the cases. I don't know if anyone has any questions. When I said it was a small building, I mean, this is, this is it. We have seen it all. Um, the locker rooms are, are impressive, but that's the really only other part of the building. Uh, there are another material out here, these Mexican uh, river rocks that bring you up. And the landscape here was done by Peter Osler. And I want to leave you with a, uh, a view back. I'm not sure we're actually going to be able to see past the sun, uh, but I'll walk a little bit out into this meadow. Uh, now the pathway that you see here is the fire um, emergency services route because the building doesn't have any sort of parking lot attached to it. Um, and that was part of maintaining Sarnen's sense of the campus landscape. All of our 90s buildings are incredibly sensitively sited. And this one, uh, they were so concerned with the trees that were here, they did not allow a single tree to be cut down on any side of the building. And so they had to backfill around the tree trunks and make these huge mounds of dirt and then build the concrete and steel frame as if they were building like a truss under a river. So they carved into these new uh, uh, wooden mounds 
cast the concrete, built the steel frame, erected the entire building, and then backhoed the pool out from the completed structure. And then once they had backhoed out the pool, they could build the brick walls that are the, the surface we see. But the reason they had to go to that length is because it's such a severe slope and Cranbrook refused to allow any trees to be cut down. And so the entire building, had they tried to just sort of sit it on the slope, uh, they were worried about taking the entire hill out and the building never actually locking in and becoming structural. And so what did they do with all the dirt at this sort of last minute when they backco out the entire function of the building? Uh, this is the rest of the pool. And so they they excavate the dirt and they move it all over here. And why in the world would they do that? Well, Eliel Saarinen, when he designed the school for boys in 1927, uh, all of the boys even the ones who lived in Detroit and Pontiac uh, were boarders. It was about 55 boarders and 20 day students. And the day students were generally neighborhood farming children. And so there was no idea to, that there would ever need to be a bus or a car drop off. And so part of building the natatorium was to build a connection for cars to be able to get as close as they ever can to the main quadrangle of the school for boys. But the problem with this car turnaround is that it would be on this major axis. And so if the cars were blocking your view, I mean, what a crime against our sensitive artistic nature, really a crime against humanity to have to look at cars as you stand at the art museum. And so instead, the pool was excavated, the dirt was put under where I am now, and we used the great English landscape gardening technique of the ha-ha wall which is when you build up your lawn so high uh, that as the lawn uh, as the lawn builds up the hill, you create a sharp drop off in the lawn and that's where you put your fence and then you bring the lawn back on the other side and you keep your sheep wherever they need to be. You can hide an entire village like at Blenheim Palace. They put the village behind a ha-ha wall and so that when you stand here at the sort of sacred core of Cranbrook, the, the art museum enclave, and you look back at the natatorium, do you see how the grass is beginning to meet that grass? And so you cannot tell that there is a bus turnaround there. And then if I were to keep walking all the way back to the fountain, when you're standing at the Orpheus fountain, you look down and all you see is grass. And then you see the beautiful teal wall. You see the row of trees and you have this completed vision. It's pretty darn amazing. And what a commitment to beauty. Um, I miss Dr. Lillian Bowder and her willingness to pay for all of this, our fine ways to pay for this. Um, I, it's an amazing project. I think it's one of their best. Oddly enough, it is the third pool that they had built and they built more pools since this pool. So talk about a niche firm. Uh, and if you aren't familiar with their work, go to their website, TWBT. Um, uh, and you can see some of their projects like the American Folk Art Museum in New York that was torn down by MoMA, uh, or the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia that robbed Dr. Barnes's collection out of the suburbs into the city. And now you can also see uh, they're building President Obama's library in Chicago uh, and destroying part of Jackson Park. So they are mired in controversy wherever they go, but they leave a trail of gorgeous, one-of-a-kind hand-hewn building. So thanks so much for joining me on this tour of the Natatorium, and I hope that you're all well. On Tuesday, I'll be coming live at 5 from Cranbrook Academy of Art Library, looking at some of our book collection and some of our treasures of, of art and design books. So I'll see you there. Have a great weekend. Happy Memorial Day. Be safe, everyone.